Soldier Field along the shores of Lake Michigan is the home of the Chicago Bears again in 1972 for the second straight season. And there's a new head coach for a team whose history only rarely has been interrupted by such changes. The new man is volatile, intensely dedicated Abe Gibran, who represents only the sixth different head coaching regime in the 53 years of the Bears. He is as strong and long on leadership as he was great in his NFL playing days. His demands are simple, effort, action, aggressiveness, discipline. In 1972, the Bears responded with all-out exciting football for the most part. They created the excitement of the unexpected. But radical rebuilding in football never is a job that is completed overnight. It was part of a changeover in tactics that came with the change in leadership. Fourth down kicking situations that were converted into surprising and successful offensive forays sleight of hand maneuvering on a kickoff, and other samples of the imagination that Abe Gibran put into reconstructing the Bears' attack. This wasn't all showmanship or gimmick football by any means. It was part of a game plan. It kept opponents honest and maintained their respect for a team that has so proud a tradition. Opening day brought the Atlanta Falcons, and the Bears weren't quite ready on either offense or defense. Yet, there were individual efforts worth noting. Jim Harrison, number 35, ran for 115 yards on the ground. Quarterback Bobby Douglas added another 70. The Bears would rush for more than 200 yards as a team, and Douglas threw two scoring strikes. One to fifth round draft pick Bob Parsons and one to second year man Earl Thomas, number 82. Mistakes put them 31 to seven behind at the half and their game second half comeback was too late for a recovery. At that, they held Atlanta to two field goals in the second half. The following week, the Bears defense held Los Angeles to 160 yards total offense and the only Ram TD came on an interception. Though Douglas connected again with Thomas, it wound up a 13-13 tie. The Detroit Lions came along next and scored first. No novelty to the Bears, whose season pattern saw opponents hit first in 11 of 14 games. But trailing or not, the Bears usually made a contest out of it. On a fourth and punt situation with Detroit leading 28 to 10, Dick Butkus was the up man and took the pass from center to run 28 yards. Butkus run revived the Bears rushing game and with three and a half minutes left, they fought to within seven points.
But a weird bounce of the ball turned into a Detroit interception, and that was that. In the loss, the Bears had more than 250 yards rushing and made excellent use of the option play. Harrison was one of the keys to the option in this one, for his good running made the defense respect any fake by Douglas. Bobby, of course, could pitch to a trailing back or pass, but the option was most dangerous when he kept it himself and turned upfield. At season's end, the Bears had close to 2,400 yards rushing, leaders in the National Conference and fourth in the league overall. The first road game of the season was at Green Bay, the 107th renewal of pro football's longest series. Again, the Bears had to come from behind after trailing 17 to three at the half. Douglas completed one pass for 46 yards to George Farmer in the course of a touchdown move. But when clutch yardage was needed, they went to the ground and scored twice rushing. The offense, though late starting, was matched in efficiency by the defense, which didn't allow a single touchdown. One Packer score came on a fumble. Then a great play by the Bears, Joe Taylor, number 20, became a deflected pass into John Stagger's hands and the score. Saddest development of the afternoon, however, after the Bears had tied it up in the second half, was a field goal by Chester Marcole of Green Bay with 30 seconds to go that won the game. Cleveland was the scene of the start of a Bears winning streak, and it was a decisively smashing one, too, a 17 to nothing shutout. Although Douglas completed only two passes, one was a touchdown. Douglas ran for 115 of the 250 yards rushing accumulated by the Bears. Bobby's longest run of the season was a 57 yarder on a bootleg that fooled everyone. And at the end, he had to fend off two Browns pursuers inside the 10. The Monday night game against Minnesota was a memorable classic, even though the Vikings scored first. The old familiar story. But the Bears defense soon began to make the crucial plays. Butkus recovered a fumble, and late in the game came up with an interception to stop another Viking drive. In the first half, the Bears offense controlled the ball in spectacular fashion. They were in possession for 25 minutes, and the Vikings had the ball on only 10 plays. Then, the unexpected. A fourth down fake field goal that kept the drive alive and put the Bears ahead in the first half. With the score tied at 10 all in the final period, punter Bobby Joe Green hit Cecil Turner on a fourth down fake. A little later, a more conventional pass to Jim Seymour kept a drive going onto the lead field goal by Mac Percival. In this second straight win, the Bears defense played it tough. The offense rolled up nearly 200 yards rushing and cashed in on two significant timely fourth down gambles. Against St. Louis, where the Cards became the third consecutive victim, Douglas had his best passing day of the year. He completed eight out of nine, including a 73-yard bomb to Farmer.
Douglas ran for a score, and still another came on a reverse from Ron Smith to Earl Thomas that wound up as an 82-yard kickoff return. Finally, there was that Bears defense, sweeping in waves, shaking the ball loose, and then capturing it. The victory run ended the next week at Detroit, where the Lions scored twice in the first half, enough for the 14 to nothing win. Though it was only the eighth game of the schedule, Douglas raised his rushing total to 556 yards, breaking Greg Landry's record for yards rushing by a quarterback. Again, the defense played recklessly, led by Butkus. Four times, Landry was intercepted in the second half. Once by Ron Smith, twice by Joe Taylor, and once by Charlie Ford. But the offense was unable to capitalize on those turnovers. The Bears defense had new names, new bodies, especially in the line. There was number 87, Steve DeLong, who came in a trade from San Diego. Rookie tackles number 67, Bill Line, and number 68, Jim Osborne, were starters. They were ably backed up by veteran Andy Rice, number 70. Tony McGee, number 71, had a fine sophomore season on the young, rebuilt defensive line. In the secondary, Charlie Ford, number 32, had seven interceptions to lead in that department for the second straight year. It was Ford's sophomore season, too, by the way. And a strong man back there also was number 20, Joe Taylor. Ron Smith is one of the NFL's leading exponents of the safety blitz. Ron had additional value as a kickoff return man who led the league in that category. He averaged 30.8 yards per return. Rounding out the secondary is another second year reliable, Jerry Moore, number 18. Of course, the heart of the entire Chicago defense is that great linebacking trio, the three Bs, Doug Buffone, number 55, Dick Butkus, number 51, and Ross Brubacher, number 31. A fourth man, Jimmy Gunn, number 30, adds depth, plus the fact that he captains the special teams. In fact, every member of the Bear defense is a tough hitter. In the rematch with Green Bay, that tough-hitting Bears defense was effective again. In effect, the Bear defense wasn't accountable for the two Packer touchdowns. One came on a long kickoff return, 
and the other was set up by a bad snap on a putting situation deep in Chicago territory. The Bears, as usual, were behind from the start, but going to the running game, balanced with an occasional pass, they managed to get to within three points at 20 to 17 late in the fourth quarter. A Chester Markhole field goal made the lead 23-17 with 1.46 to go. In the time remaining, a pass was broken up and the Bears relinquished possession near midfield. When the Bears entertained the San Francisco 49ers the following week, it was another match against a team that would go into the NFL playoffs. Against the 49ers, they had to come out of their most hopeless situation of the year. They were down by 21 to nothing in the third quarter before they went to work. For the day, Ron Smith returned six kickoffs, 206 yards, and one of those set up the first Bears score. Then, in quick succession, Douglas connected for two scoring pitches. One went to Jim Seymour, number 84, for 35 yards. The other was an 85-yarder to Farmer that brought the Bears up to 27 to 21. But the 49ers hit again for the final margin. By now, the Bears were surprising no one with their habit of falling behind early or their will to win that kept them in contention no matter what the score might have been. The Philadelphia Eagles became the Bears' fourth victim of 1972, even though once again the Bears were behind at halftime, 12-7. Alert play by the special teams allowed the Bears' defense to write the story at Philadelphia. They allowed only 83 rushing yards. They sacked Eagle quarterback six times, and they intercepted three passes. The offense was in its regular pattern. Douglas set up a touchdown with one pass completion and then scored twice on runs of 19 and 32 yards. To cap the proceedings, the Bears collaborated at improvising a conversion point on the third score, just as they did against Washington a year ago, and the same pair did it, Douglas to Butkus. The season finale was a loss to the playoff-bound Raiders at Oakland, and the special teams provided the excitement. 
Smith ran back the opening kickoff 94 yards for a touchdown to give the Bears a unique sensation. They led at the outset for a change. Later in the first half, Craig Clemens broke through, blocked Jerry DePoister's punt, and Ross Brubacher fell on the ball in the end zone for a touchdown. Douglas rushed for 127 yards to bring his season total to 968 yards, not far from double the record of 530 yards set by Greg Landry a year ago. Bobby Douglas provided much of 1972's excitement for the Bears, but not without the help of a fast-developing young offensive line. Bobby, by the way, isn't averse to blocking for his fellow running backs either. But when he keeps it himself, it's excitement for the Bears. But 11 men are needed to make the option work. That teamwork and Douglas's great physical attributes combine to help him set the record. The Bears' excellent young offensive line is centered by Rich Cody, number 52, in his third NFL season. Flanking him are guards Glenn Holloway, number 61, also a third-year man, and Bob Newton, number 78, a sophomore. The tackles, number 74, Bob Asher, two years in the NFL, and veteran Randy Jackson, number 65, six years experience. That offensive line helped Bears runners average nearly 170 yards a game in 1972, best in the conference. What made this team memorable is the unity that Abe Gibran brought about in his debut as a head coach. He said he would settle only for 40 men who wanted to play football and that the squad was a team, not an offensive unit or a defensive unit exclusively. He restored mutual respect. And even a losing record cannot erase the memory of a 72 Bears team that gave it everything right down to and through the 14 games of the season.